the book of Revelation just as we have always done. We will read once again the first chapter. It's not a waste of time to read the word of God. So let's read chapter 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants uh, things which must shortly come to pass and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John who bore record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. John to the seven churches where, which are at Asia, uh, grace uh, unto you and peace from him, and this is where we stopped, uh, from him that, which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And he hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye will see him. And they also which pierced him, and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so... Amen. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in uh, tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of the Lord Jesus Christ, was in the isle of which is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are at Asia, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna and unto Pergamos and unto Thyatira and unto Sardis and unto Philadelphia and unto Laodicea. And I turned and saw the voice which spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. And his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet like unto fine brass, as they were burned in the furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun that shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of death and of hell and death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the seven angel, uh, the angels of the seven churches, and the seven uh, candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Let's look uh, at this passage again in some detail today, and we're starting in verse four here. We're in the middle of uh, John's salutation, and he said that John unto the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace be unto you in peace. And that's where we finished off. It starts off, there must be grace before there can be peace. Righteousness must come before peace. Now we come to the, the next part, and I want to just show you, if you'll notice this wonderful diagram up on the board here, this is really 
one of the greatest diagrams, um, and it's been in the church for many, many years. The, the Church of Jesus Christ has used this diagram since uh, I can uh, go back and find to explain the Trinity. That is really inexplicable, but it certainly is something that helps us. We have up at the top, the Father is God, then the Son is God, and the Spirit is God. There's a triangle there. Each one of the, of the unit is, uh, is God. The Father is God, the Son is God, and the, the Spirit is God. But, notice this carefully, the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, and the Father is not the Spirit. In other words, they are three distinct persons that exist entirely as three separate entities, but they are one. Now, you say, how can three be one? I'm not sure. I'll be honest with you. I didn't do that well in algebra. But I can tell you this beyond a, a mathematical certainty. Um, in God's arithmetic, three equals one. One God, three persons. We do not worship three gods. We worship one God. But he is three persons. The Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. Now, there are people who say there is no such thing as Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And I would beg to differ. From this very passage, we read about from God his Father in verse 6. And we go back and we look at that, that... He that which is, which was, and which is to come is a reference to God the Father. And then we have from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth. He's the second person of the divine trinity. And then we read concerning the seven spirits which are before his throne. Now I'm going to explain that to you today, but that refers to the Holy Spirit. And so we have here in this passage of Scripture, John begins with the Trinity. Now I think it's a terrible shame that living in the day that we live in today, that the Trinity is not spoken of more than it ha has been. The Unitarians have uh, got us cowed to the point where we're afraid to mention the Trinity. But ladies and gentlemen, my Bible teaches a triune God. I have one God in three persons. And though I cannot physically explain that, my friends, let me say this to you today. If I had a God I could explain, he wouldn't be much of a God, would he? I have a God who is transcendent. That word transcendent, trans means to go across. To zen, zendent means that which is above. It means he goes across and above what we understand. God is far greater than we can uh, understand. And when it comes to the place where human reason runs up against divine revelation and human reason stumbles, I must point to divine revelation and say, though I do not understand it, I believe it because God's word teaches it. And so... If you ask me to explain the Trinity, the best I can do today is show you this chart. But I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt, the Bible teaches that Jesus is God, that Christ uh, is not the Father or not the Holy Spirit. He didn't just appear to be God the Father. He didn't just appear to be Jesus. He didn't just appear. Uh, there, there is a heresy that says that. The truth of the matter is there are three persons, but they exist in one God. And they are in perfect harmony. Now, they have different works. And I want to talk about, the, uh, in the source of these blessings, I want to talk about the... the uh, uh, I will, will not talk much about the Father except to say this. And I don't want to get into this very much because at the beginning of the year, Pastor Kenny is going to be giving us a series on the book of Ephesians. And the very first chapter begins with the work of what the Father did in our salvation. And if you look at those first few verses in the book of Ephesians, you'll find my father planned it all. 
I want to say to you in the councils of eternity past, my heavenly Father made possible salvation by his great understanding and his wisdom. And in that council, he picked the only way, and I want to make that very clear, he picked the only way that he could remain just and justify those who were sinners. Now, let's be very clear about this. God doesn't let us into heaven because he's big-hearted. God, uh, we, we have this idea of a cosmic Wilford Brimley. You know, that was the old guy that used to do the Quaker Oats commercial. And he, he says, it's delicious and it's the right thing to do. He's sitting on the, the porch uh, rocking back and forth. And we got a, an idea that our God is somewhat like Wilford Brimley sitting on the, uh, on the, uh, on the porch saying, oh, I just love you so much, I'll just let you in. And there are many people who believe that even after death, you get a second chance because God is just weak and, and um, big hearted. He's a, he's a liberal. <laughs> uh, and he's just going to uh, slip you in the back door. My friends, let me say to you, the Bible presents God as the moral governor of the universe. And as the moral governor of the universe, he cannot wink at sin. He must deal with it. Sin must be dealt with. Now, his method of dealing with it is to throw you and me for all eternity in a Christless hell. And there is not from the devil to the meanest man that ever lived, there is not one single soul that can wag their tongue at him and say, you know, you're wrong about this. You, you, you're wrong to throw us into hell. Every person who goes to hell will have to admit and will admit that they are there because they refused the greatest offer that there ever was. And no one will ever say anything. To, you know why? how I know that? The book of Romans tells us that when all the world stands before God, every mouth will be stopped. Now I see some of these big mouthed uh, politicians get up there and, and they, they rattle on and all that kind of stuff and I think to myself someday when you get in the presence of King Jesus you're going to fall on your face and you will not be able to answer him. Look, John who was somebody who loved Jesus somebody who knew him who was intimate with him when he got into the presence of the resurrected Christ according to this chapter it says I fell at his feet as if I were a dead man and I, I've heard I've talked to people I, I talked to a biker one time he was he, he towered over me he must have been 6'6 six, six. He probably weighed 450 pounds. He was a big guy. He looked at me and he said, when I get up to he heaven, I am going to tell God, hey, how about a beer? Let's go out and cruise and get some chicks. And I told him, I said, sir, when you get before God, you'll be a blithering fool. And you will not be able to say, you better bow your knee right here, right now, because when you stand in his presence... You're not going to offer him a beer, my brother. You're not going to offer him uh, the opportunity to go out. I want to tell you today, you'll fall at his feet as if you were a dead man. He is that which is, that which was, and that which is to come. When God revealed himself, he said, Tell the children of Israel, I am hath sent me, hath sent you. I say this to you today. He is the eternal existence. If you get back and if we had built ourselves a time machine and we went back all the way to the beginning as far back as we could go and we opened the door and we got out of that time machine, God would greet us there. And we'd say, how long you been here? He said, for eternity. Then I can get in my time machine and I can take it all the way to the end of time as far out as you can go when time shall be no more and I can stop that vehicle and get out and there's God out there too. And he says, I'm here too. 
I can come to the present where I am now and if I will look for him, I will find that he is here too. My friends, I have a God yesterday, today, and forever. And I want to say, in a world of shifting ideas, isn't it great to have a solid rock? I'll just be honest. When I was born... For a person to commit adultery, those people were shunned in the community. Today, they're celebrated. When I was born, if somebody was effeminate, they were, uh, they were treated very badly. And just to be honest with you, they, uh, you, you didn't dare go out in public. And now, um, you can go down to Walmart, and brother, can you see some stuff? Um, and uh, we're being told today, we must be tolerant and all that. When I was born, that, that was not the case. When I was born, um, alcoholism was not considered a disease. It was considered a sin. It's the only disease you get out of a bottle. And I don't know that. And, and drug addiction was considered a sin and it was a shame. Uh, today, those people are, are lifted up. I am saying to you today, we have a society that's shifting. When, when I was born, abortion was still illegal in this country. And I'm glad of that. And I was born in a Catholic hospital. They wouldn't have, they, they wouldn't have let me die in the hospital there. The, the Catholics have always been strong on this. Uh, in, in this country... Millions and millions of little babies have been slaughtered since, since Roe versus Wade. The world has changed. Society has changed. I find that the world is no more like leave it to beaver or father knows best than it ever has been. It's just incredible to go back and look at those shows where the woman comes wearing high heels and pearls as she's been making a leg of lamb. Uh, and, and work it. And, and dad comes home and he wears a tie and he spends time talking to his kids and has a wonderful outlook and, and is able to share great wisdom and the children respect their father and all of that. Now look at the sitcoms. Mom is a transvestite. Dad is a, is a lunatic. And the kids are smarter than anybody else. I tell you today, ladies and gentlemen, things have changed as far as the world goes. But I'm glad to say, this book and my God don't change. They remain the same. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so if you don't get anything out of this message today, get this idea that we have a God who is unchanging. So that's the Father. Let's move on to the Son. Look at the titles of the Son here. The Bible says, first of all, and, and let me get there. The Bible says that Jesus is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth. Now I want you to notice, first of all, he is the faithful witness. What does that mean? Well, can I suggest to you when the Bible says Jesus is the faithful witness, it means that God wanted us to understand who he was and what he was. You know, you can read in the Old Testament and there's a lot of great information about God. We read that he hates sin and that he loves sinners and uh, we read that uh, he's holy and unapproachable by, by mortal man and all of that. We can read all of that kind of stuff. But you know, to be honest with you, it really is just all academic when you read it that way. But what if there was a person who could come down to this world and manifest what it was like, to, to what God is really like? Jesus Christ is that manifestation. He came down here to faithfully represent all that God is. Brother Gene and I were talking before the service about uh, a man who said that Jesus fulfilled the Ten Commandments. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law of God. He not only fulfilled it, but he filled it full. 
It was describing him. And everything that is about Jesus in the law, everything about the, the law, J Jesus actually fulfilled all of that. And he could stand up and say, which of you convinceth me of sin? And there's not a person that wagged their tongue at him. He never coveted. He never lied. He never killed. He never stole. He never committed adultery. He never used the name of the Lord his God in vain. He was absolutely perfect in every sense of the term. Even in the Sabbath day, and we talked about this this morning, he is the fulfillment of the Sabbath. When, when Jesus came, the Pharisees had put all this crud around the Sabbath day. You couldn't do this, and you couldn't do that, and you couldn't do something else. That's not what it was intended for, and Jesus made the point. He said, man was not made for the Sabbath. Sabbath was made for the man. And he said... I, one greater than David is here, and I am also Lord of the Sabbath. And, and so let me say this to you today. Um, the Lord Jesus uh, was the fulfillment of the law of God, and we saw it. We saw it is possible for a human being to live without sin from the time that he's born. And, and by the way, we're going to have the nativity story this morning. Um, I watched it again last night, and I cried my eyes out all through the movie. So if you, I'm going to sit in the back. Um, if you hear this sobbing, it's me. Because um, aside from the wise men being at the manger, this thing is accurate. Um, and when I saw that baby that portrayed the Lord Jesus Christ. My heart just broke because I knew he was born to die. And the, there, there's a moment, and I won't tell you about it, I don't want to spoil the movie, but there's a very cynical man who when he comes to present his gift to Christ is the high point of the movie for me. The change that takes place in his life. I'm going to tell you something, my friends. Jesus was God in the flesh. He was God's faithful witness. Everything that God is, Jesus is. As the little girl said, he's God with a face. And I can, when I'm broken hearted, I can go to somebody I know will understand. But when, when I, ha I, I have disappointed myself because my strength is not good, I can go to him and be comforted. I, I'm on this diet, and there are times, particularly at night, when I get so hungry. I mean, I, I get so hungry. And then I thought to myself about how often the Bible talks about Jesus being a hungered. And I just go to him and say, God... Jesus, I know you know what it's like to be hungry. Will you help me? And you know what? It works. It really does. I think about him, and I start contemplating that. And you know what? I don't want to turn stones to bread anymore. And I don't want to slip into the refrigerator anymore. Why? Because I know that it's not the body for meats, but the meats for the body. Jesus is the faithful witness. Number two... The Bible says that he is the first begotten of the, of the dead. Now that is, oh brethren, um, I could spend an entire sec session on that. There, there's a passage in, and in fact, let's just look at it. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Um, I hadn't meant to do this today. I, I'm so anxious to get to the seven spirits. Um, but I gotta, I've got to do this. Um, turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse number 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Now, that term, first fruits, is really important. In the Bible... 
there was a feast that took place where the children of Israel celebrated those first barley stalks, those first wheat stalks, those first grains that began to come up they gathered them all up and they gave them to the Lord. They waved them before the Lord, did a wave offering before the Lord. What that wave offering does is to say, Lord, we recognize that you gave us this grain. This grain comes from you. And this is the first that came. And so you get the first. By the way, there's a principle there. We take care of God before we take care of anything else. God gets priority with your time, with your talent, with your material substance. God gets first place. That, that's a Bible principle. It runs throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. We put God first. And, and I don't care what you want to call it. I call it priority. God gets the first consideration in everything. I don't make a plan without asking God, Lord, what's your plan? I, I, don't, I don't try and do things without consulting God and saying, what would you have me to do? And, and my friends... God deserves first place. We need to give him the first place in every aspect of our life. Now, there is no law that says I have to. I'll just be honest with you. The New Testament is a principle of grace. The Bible doesn't tell me that I have to give God first place. But as a redeemed soul, as somebody who has been saved from hell, I want to. It is my desire. I desire to make God first in all things. Now, Jesus, therefore, represents that first fruits. That is... On Resurrection Sunday, he came forth out of that grave in newness of life. And he presented himself before the Father. And you know what Paul said? He said here that when Jesus did that, he's the first fruits. Yeah, anybody ever watch the, the Rose Parade on, on TV? Um few people will admit that. I, I, I don't have TV anymore, but I, like, I liked it when I had TV. I liked to watch the Rose Parade. And you know, it was always fun to see the Grand Marshal. He kind of rides up front and, and, and he gets everything started up. Jesus Christ is the Grand Marshal of the Resurrection Parade. He's the first fruits and on Resurrection Sunday, he came forth in newness of life. Think of that for a minute. The grave is no longer a one-way street. He tore the bars away. And he made it a thoroughfare. We don't now go into the grave. And I have stood before the graves of about 60 or 70 people in my ministry and buried them. And I never thought once... Well, you know what? This is the last we'll ever see of old so-and-so. No, sir. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I, just like you deposit that seed in the ground, so when that day comes and there comes that clarion call when he says, Come up hither! The voice of the archangel and the trump of God, we shall rise on that day. And bless God, I'd love to be in the cemetery to see it. Now, some people say, well, I don't think there'll be any disturbance or whatever like that. It'd just be a spiritual thing. I, the, he's getting those bodies. And those bodies... Um, I don't know whether they'll burst out of the graves or, or what. All I have to go on is what happened after Jesus rose from the dead, the Bible says that there were many who had died, many of the Old Testament dead, 
who came after his resurrection and testified that Jesus had been raised from the dead. Now they did that physically and bodily. I don't know, did they go back to, uh, back to the grave? The Bible doesn't tell us, but it does say this, that there were many that came from the grave and appeared unto many and convinced them that Jesus had risen from the dead. Now that's a remarkable passage. So, so they're coming behind in the resurrection prayer. And then the Bible tells me that all of us who are caught up together with the Lord in the clouds of the air will be changed and we're in the parade. We've not yet died, but we're, we're in that great parade. And we can say, the, the, the dead who have died in the Lord can say, O grave, where is thy victory? And those of us who are alive can say, O death, where is thy sting? Aren't you glad of that? I don't want de death to sting me. I hope you don't want death to sting you. Uh, and, and then behind them, at the, uh, at the time that the Lord Jesus Christ comes back to establish his kingdom, there's going to be a resurrection of the tribulation saints and of the Old Testament saints. They're going to be uh, resurrected at that time. And then finally, leaving uh, all of those, there'll be a, a resurrection at the great white throne judgment where all the dead, small and great, who are left, and the only people who are left dead are now the lost. They're going to be resurrected. They're going to be the ones making up the end of that parade. But I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is the first fruits. And because he lives... All of those who have been lost and, and, and by, by way of death, lost to you, lost to me, if they knew the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, we shall see them again. And we shall see them again because we have historical certainty. I'm not just guessing. I'm just not hoping. I'm not like the little boy in the cemetery whistling in the dark. I know that my Redeemer liveth. Why? Because Jesus is alive. And because he lives, I too shall live. My precious mama and my precious daddy buried on a hillside in West Virginia. My sweet godly grandmother who the reason I'm saved today is because of her prayers. I long sometimes just to, just to hold her again. I long to touch her. I'll never forget the day we buried her. It was so cold. The snow was, was so deep. And, and we got the, the, the casket out and the roses, which had been beautifully red, turned black immediately. It was that cold. And I thought to myself, I, I just can't believe we're going to leave her out here. But we were just planting a seed, brethren. He's the first begotten of the dead. And then the Bible says, I have to close with this. The Bible says he's the prince of the kings of the earth. You know, there's a lot of to do about Donald Trump today. Whether you like him or you hate him or whatever like that, he certainly caused a stir, hadn't he? And, you know, people get all Twitter-pated. I hate to use that word, uh, using Twitter, because uh, everybody's using it today. People get all Twitter-pated about important people, people of power. But I want to say this to you today. You've never seen anything yet. My Bible tells me that Jesus Christ is the prince of the kings of the earth. What does that mean? It means that he has all power. Now, there are two words in the Bible for power. One of them is exousia. Exousia simply means uh, authority. Jesus said, all power is given to me in heaven and earth, all exousia. In other words, there is nobody who can exceed my authority. I don't care what the FCC says. Jesus is in charge. I don't care what the government regulations say. Jesus is in charge. I don't care what the world thinks about it or what the professor smell fungus at the local uh, college thinks about it. Jesus is 
Lord, he is God. And he rules with a rod of iron. He's the prince of the kings of the earth. I want to say this to you today. You're going to bow before him someday. Now you will either bow willingly now or unwillingly later. But you will bow. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God. Those men that stood before him at the cross said he saved others. Himself he cannot save. If you be Christ come down from the cross. But my friends, he stayed on the cross. He shed his precious blood. He was buried and on the third day he burst the bonds of death and came out of that grave and became prince of the kings of this world. And he shall reign forever and ever. Amen. And my friends, let me say this to you today. The, the more practical application is we're not, I'm not so much worried about the government. I'm not so much worried about the politicians. But what I am concerned about, and, and I close the message with this. Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords in your life. It is not that we should go through the Bible and say, how can I find a loophole or an exception to get out of what God's Word clearly says? It is up to us to obey and to obey with a cheerful heart. Jesus is Lord. He is King. He is God Almighty. And therefore, it is my responsibility to acknowledge His Lordship by obeying His Word instantly, cheerfully, and completely. I taught that to the kids the other day in, in Starbase. Um, there are only three things that are required of obedience. Number one, we should obey instantly. Number two, we should obey cheerfully. And number three, we should obey completely. And you know what, friends? If we did that, churches would be different. Lives would be different. I ask you the question this morning. I ask you to look in your own heart and say, is Jesus really King of kings and Lord of lords? Do I absolutely yield my will to him? Do I say, as he said to the heavenly Father, not my will, but thine be done. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father and our